so I'd like to invite uh, a welcome to SOAS, uh, Rolando Cotto Solano from uh, Dartmouth uh, University. Uh, Rolando uh, received his PhD from the University of Arizona, and he's a professor of uh, computational linguistics, and um, he's developed lots of very interesting tools for uh, low resource, uh, NLP tools for low resource languages, uh, some of which I've tested out, and they're very successful, and uh, we're extremely uh, uh, keyed up to, to see you know, how, how they develop. Um, so uh, without further ado, perhaps we'll, we'll begin. Yes, and All right. uh, yeah. let's see. Let me just set up the keyboard here. Okay. And um, well, again, to the people watching the video, thank you so much. For, for being here. Uh, we'll be doing this in a little bit more of a seminar style, but I'll still be sure to be addressing you um, as we go. And thank you for being here. So the summary of it is that there's been very interesting developments in artificial intelligence over the last four or five years. Surely you've seen the news about things like ChatGPT and how Google Translate has indigenous languages. And uh, there's been a lot of developments in artificial intelligence that we could be using to automate some of the tasks that are most difficult in language documentation. So for me, the one that's really the bottleneck is the transcription, because everything depends on it, and it takes forever, as you all know. So I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in parsing as a way to annotate corpora. I'm very interested in making tools that can serve the purpose of language revitalization and reclamation. So things that for computer scientists might seem trite and boring, things like predictive keyboard keyboards, but for communities, they are of incredible consequence because they are, are the things that could make new domains of speech and that can truly make you keep the language going and could bring even the youth in so that they can uh, continue to use the language. And uh, obviously it takes a village. So I do want to acknowledge the Cook Islands team. Sally Akilai Nicholas is going to be one of the main characters of the story. She is a professor of linguistics and Maori studies in the University of Auckland. Um, she is a linguist extraordinaire and her work, uh, her documentation work is the one that we're trying to support with our tools. Um, Dean Takura Mason is, the, is going to be the voice of the text to speech. She is an incredibly generous with her time and with her knowledge of the Cook Islands Maori culture and language. Um, teachers who are people who are trained to be high school and school teachers throughout the Cook Islands have helped us. People from the School of Malke, Tyler Peterson, Philippi Wills, Liam Kokawa, Emma Nakurabal uh, Paolo. Sami Hadara, Victoria Quinn, Jessica Chen, Syed Tanvir, Sarah Carnes, Brian Dudek, Carolyn Conway, Hermila Fentall have helped us with aspects of the thesis, and there's more people coming in, and then thanks to them as well. On the Chipchen team for the Costa Rican languages, Vivian and Kabekar, and we have Sophia Flores, who found the corpus, Isaac, um, V, Annie, Katarine, Mien, Sharid, Guillermo, Taiwan, Freddie, Franklin, Alex, and more people joining in, uh, thanks to them these tools are working. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a little bit first about natural language processing, language documentation, a little bit about the Riri people and the language and Cook Islands Maori, and about algorithms that we can use to make NLP. And how more objectives are in the future. And as again, people in the audience, if at any point you have questions or comments, by all means. <laughs> So yeah, like, I mean, you know, like transcription, <laughs> to me, this task is not only, it's strange because it is so time consuming, but it's incredibly repetitive, but also incredibly, it needs high levels of expertise. Like you can't just put your headphones on and listen to music while you do it. You have to be completely focused. And yet it's something where it's like, the frequent words are gonna be the frequent words again and again and again. Like surely a computer could be trained to do this. There's the translation of our corpora, for example, which we also need if we're doing research or if we're doing educational material, for example. Um, this, the transcription we need for linguistics, but of course we need it to create children's books, for example, or to create something that um, schools can use to train more speakers, more readers in the languages. We like annotating corpora, for example, 
for ph uh, phonetics studies. Uh, we want to have um, alignment so that we can study fine phonetics of languages. We want to have four for annotated um, semantically, syntactically. And again, we ultimately want to turn all of these into things that could be useful for the community, for your teachers, and for the future speakers of these languages. And document date, um, transcription, of course, is the main character of the story. So people have estimated that maybe you need about 50 hours of work to transcribe one hour of audio. And I would ask you, like, how long does it take to transcribe one hour of uh, uh, audio in the languages that you're working with? Oh, uh, let's see, one hour. Mm -hmm. um, how would it be? Yeah, I, I, I suppose it would be about. Dozens of hours. Yeah, yeah, dozens. How about you? Well, because comparable, I work very little in translation, to be honest. Mm -hmm. In Tibetan, I was working more like on the classical, like that. You may have it. But, yeah. yeah, but <coughs> little than, yeah, I think that's the proportion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really time consuming. Absolutely. It's time consuming, but also the expert knowledge is insane yeah. how much you need to get these to a reliable version and also a, like, a version with a stable orthography. Have you done any transcription work? A little bit, mm -hmm. um, not really continuous speech, but mm -hmm. anecdotally, mm -hmm. it took me, it takes on average two and a half to four hours to get through about 25 sentences. Yeah, wow. so, so it's, yeah, yeah, no, this is insane that it stops everything else as you study. Yeah. And of course the technology is not perfect, so all of you have probably watched YouTube with auto-generated subtitles and they're not perfect, but it does exist for many languages. So it's a technology that we could use for the languages that we work with as well. Um, the transcription is one part. We evidently also want corpora that are properly tagged to study, again, phonetics, to study syntax, semantics. We want to translate them. Um, this is like, it destroys your soul. Like doing alignments by hand is something that takes hours upon hours of finally figuring out where each sound is. Um, Translating is also like a very cognitively heavy task that only very few people could do. If you think about who can annotate our corpora, in my experience, for example, in Latin America and Polynesia, it's usually school teachers. Those are the only people who would know enough of the languages to be able to write them in a stable manner and who also care about this work. And they're the busiest people on planet Earth. They, there's no, you, I mean, Money cannot make them work with you because they're already so busy preparing the classes and caring for the children, doing impossible things to educate children in the most dire circumstances. So this is not a problem that you can just throw money at. <coughs> and again, we also want these to make things like books and tools so that children can learn the languages, and also tools to make the languages um, relevant for the daily lives of speakers, things that they can use to message each other, things that they can use to make jokes, to tell people that they love each other, so that it, uh, they can feel the presence of the languages in their daily life, which is, of course, one of the things that is lost with language displacement. So, um, I'm from Costa Rica, and I've mostly worked on Latin America, I've worked with languages in Mexico and Bolivia and the southern US, but mostly with languages in Costa Rica. I worked in New Zealand for about three years, and that's how I started working with Cook Islands Mami, which is located in central Polynesia. Let's look at Grey Reef first. So the Grey language has about 7,000 speakers in Costa Rica, in these regions here. There's a mountain range in between the two, which is why these uh, groups are separate. By the way, just uh, check Costa Rica is here in Central America. The language belongs to a family called Chipton languages, which are spoken here in Panama and parts of Colombia. It is a very rural community. Um, there might be as many as 7,000 speakers and as few as 3,000 speakers. A new census is coming out soon. Hopefully, we'll have more information. It is vulnerable in that there are still ch some children who speak the language, but not all children speak the language. Um, as uh, I have linguists here, so uh, interesting features about Great Reef Grammar. It is an ergative language, it's SOB, so you can have I ergative, the house soft. You have inflectional morphology, so um mm, would be the conjugation for the uh, past perfect, and some lane would be the 
propagation for the task input. You have uh, things that would be difficult for a machine to translate. So, for example, you have very complex demonstratives. Do a would be that bird, but do I e is that bird up there, up here and nearby. Do dia we have bird down there and very far away. Do se is a bird that you can hear but you cannot see in your surroundings. So you can see how the, the machine translation system would from would produce very clunky translations going from here to here. And if you only have the English that bird, it will be very indeterminate how to generate this word when you go in this direction of machine translation. It has numerical classifiers, standard with Japanese, Mandarin Chinese, uh, do what are two birds, birds are flat, and araku, poor, are two women, women are humans. The data that we have comes from two sources mainly. There's an oral corpus uh, reported by Sophia Flores, and we are in the process of continuing its transcription. Right now, there are seven, 68 minutes of transcribed audio. These are mostly some additional songs, there's stories, there's um, instructions on how to make cocoa, for example, which we'll look at in a couple of minutes. We also have publications from Costa Rican universities, for example, there are dictionaries, there are books to learn the languages, so we have some examples from those. We have managed to gather about 90,000 words of monolingual text. And again, if you think of the MLT applications that you might be used to, like for Tibetan, like what is the size of your Oh, That's right. Millions. Millions. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll ask you about them more later, but yeah, you probably you probably used to deal dealing with with millions of words. Things work very differently when you're this slow. For example, word embeddings to do the semantics when you uh, use the contemporary transformer systems. The system can learn a lot uh, less semantics from such little density of data. Let's cross the ocean. So you, um, I am from here. I worked here for a couple of years, sorry, here in Wellington. Somewhere in the middle, there's the Cook Islands. This is um, a country separate, but with an association treaty with New Zealand, so they have New Zealand passports. Um, the main island is Rarotonga, which has a large um, airport and receives many tourists. And there are some smaller islands, which don't, which are very small airports and have almost no tourists. Mauke, for example, is going to be uh, is the island where uh, Sally Nicholas is from, Sally Akiva Nicholas. The language is about 13,000 speakers in the Cook Islands and at least 8,000 more in Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand. It is highly endangered in Rarotonga because there's so much contact with English because of the tourism and because it's where the capital is, so it's where most of the contact is with New Zealand. It is vulnerable in many of the other smaller islands. So in Mauke, for example, children in school still speak the language, you can find them speaking, speaking it with each other. Almost no children in Rarotonga speak the Cook Islands model language. Um, something that helps us to do the speech recognition, it has relatively few phonemes, so five vowels, it also has long vowels. It has only nine consonants, whereas Riri has seven oral consonants and five nasal consonants. It has five tones, and it has, uh, sorry, did I say consonants? Seven nasal vowels, <laughs> seven, seven oral vowels, seven nasal vowels, five tones, many more consonants. Um, so this one has a, a relatively small phonemic inventory. It has isolating morphology, so it doesn't really uh, have all the inflections in the words. Quantum ali kitao, the perfect plant, I, Accusative, the tau. I planted the tau. Quakarukeatu te kuri, the dogs have left. You can see, for example, that both the, perf the perfect tense and the plural number are separate words. Which helps because you don't have to learn such so morphology. <laughs> uh, this whole thing started because my colleague here, Akiva Nicholas, she did her PhD, she is from the island of Bauke, and did her PhD writing a grammar book at Asmani. Within that PhD, she recorded dozens of hours of elders telling stories, genealogies, but she faced a challenge. She 
we, we met, she said that she just had so much data that she was going to die before it was finished. So is there something that can be done? And so everything you're going to see here is an attempt to answer that question. Can anything be done to transcribe these in a manner that is quicker and useful to the for the documentation of the language? It's very linguistically rich in that it has good conversations, stories, it is relatively sparsely annotated, which is what we're trying to fix, and transcription is, of course, the main issue. Over the last three to four years, uh, we've managed to transcribe about four hours, which is sort of, uh, this is four. Um, we've used the system to accelerate that, more on that in a minute. One of the first things we tried was using something called untrained force alignment. So taking a model for English, and then like, stuffing the model's body into it. So, Thorata would be like theirs. Um, let's say you want to get an alignment like this, where you have the A with its phonetics, the T with its phonetic correspondence. We used an English model and then taught it that there were some words in English that sounded like to rat to to try to find it. It was a simple fix, but it was actually the error was only about 8% in finding the center of the words, and the error was only about 25% in the center of the vowels. It was not as difficult to correct it later, it was still time consuming, but it helped us do like start our research. We got about 4,000 vowels with which we managed to make uh, vowel charts. You can notice, for example, that these oos are here in the more canonical position, and those oos are more central. These two islands have large airports and receive a lot of New Zealand tourists, and New Zealanders kind of pronounce their oos in this region. These islands have really small airports and almost yet no New Zealanders. Theirs it corresponds to the more canonical Polynesian position of the model. And to be very honest, we don't have an explanation for my man here yet. Um, but we do have the hypothesis that contact with English is changing the, uh, the phonemic inventory. And we got this from several thousand vowels that we got because we jammed the words into a model for English. So even weird and creative solutions can really help you get started. We presented it to the school teachers who were training. And it was a very positive reaction because they said that they were proud and excited to have complex and sophisticated languages because we were, of course, telling them about these patterns uh, for the vowels, for the context, for the glottals. Uh, the glottals are becoming laryngeal and creaky voice in some circumstances. We managed to get a thousand of these examples too. And this, of course, goes against the narrative that the language is invalid or simpler than English. So not only is this a very desirable result, it also made it so that people wanted to work with us to continue getting more information. <coughs> so, let me tell you a little bit about those things that have changed in the last couple of years. First of all, I mean, well, I need to tell my crown about this, but mostly for CS people, they're not used to working with such low resource languages. They get, you know, a huge zip file in English and think that everything was just fine. Obviously, we cannot do that for our languages. The data is not just sparse, but it's so difficult to generate. It's expensive precisely because there's so few people who have the expertise, so few of the school teachers can work with us, and it takes much longer, and it's much more expensive to find experts who have the spelling of the language. I don't know if this happens where you work, but uh, there's a lot of orthographic divergence with these, so different, for example, different scholars choose different systems. Um, uh, members of the community might say, I'm just going to write it as I hear it, which is beautiful, and please do so. The important thing is to get is to keep using these languages. It should be to, up to us, the computer scientists, to figure out how to teach the computer to deal with this. But it is a statistically difficult problem, how to deal with so much variation in such a sparse data set. Of course, these languages are found in more complex sociolinguistic environments. There's going to be code switching, for example, Bukhara's body in English, and really in Spanish. And out of a perverse coincidence, it, like languages like Mandarin and English, like the ones that usual tools are made for, they're not that morphologically rich. So languages with rich morphology are going to have corpora even more sparse. Like, in order, in, if you have a million words in English, you're going to find run and running much more often than the corresponding conjugations in a language with many verbal conjugations. So I'm going to give you examples of four particular areas, speech recognition, machine translation, parsing, and predictive keywords. Uh, it's very, very difficult 
to transcribe. But as I told you, there has been a lot of progress in this area in this last five years, mostly in helping the computer understand context, helping the computer remember what things it has seen before. In previous systems, you, let's say you had a sound recording, and then every five milliseconds you try to figure out what was the sound here, what was the sound here, what was the sound here. So the system would try to say, get something like, and then try to see if that sequence of potential guesses um, sums up to one orthographic English word. But it didn't have a lot, of, it didn't have a way to read beyond its local window. It had very little information about its context. In the, <coughs> they, were really, they, they started being invented in the 80s. They weren't really uh, implemented strongly until the 2000s because of hardware constraints, really. But in the 2000s, people used new types of neural networks that had some memory for what they saw before. Um, we, these are Google Air, um, RNNs, LSTMs, like large, long short-term memory uh, networks, where if you're reading this window here, for example, you could, you could transmit information of what you saw later into the prediction of what you were seeing before. And you can transmit the prediction of what you were predict, seeing now into the future to see if it has some use. You can see how in linguistics, in cases of corticulation, in cases where one phone, uh, phone influences the other, this would be highly desirable. This was one thing that was implemented that really helped. The, uh, a particular algorithm called Deep Speech, which is from about 10 years ago, was very good at doing this. In about 2018, um, there was an algorithm invented called Transformers. Trans uh, are you familiar with Transformers? A little? No? A little? So they, probably, I mean, probably on chat to you for this. Um, they take strings of input, turn them into some intermediate representation, and then transform that intermediate representation into another uh, output string. And these can be anything. This can be a question, intermediate, decoded into an answer. This could be English, encoded, and then you decode it into German. Or, in our case, it could be bits of sound that you encode and you decode into a potential orthographic representation. This is very useful, however, it consumes frightful amounts of data in order for it to train correctly. The really big leap that happened is that now we have um, enough data from main languages, large languages in English, Mandarin, Hungarian, Swedish, uh, Spanish, where those can aid us in our transcription. So for example, the Cook Islands Maori A ah, is gonna sound a lot like things that are certain in Spanish or Hungarian or Japanese. And so newer mechanisms have a way of going through the windows of the sound, trying to see if they match things they have learned in other languages and incorporating this information into how they produce their output. There's a particular algorithm called wave to vec 2 uh, from Meta, if I remember correctly, and it, it has this. Because it is supported with multilingual information, it can produce better guesses with less data. Because if it doesn't have enough more information to support its prediction, it draws from its other languages to try to have a guess of what's happening. Notice, interestingly, that this is going to be better with sounds than with words because it's prioritizing understanding which sounds it has from its other data. The particular words of the language it has to learn from its own data set. And so you're gonna get better, very good character uh, accuracy. You're gonna hear, you're gonna see characters that sound very much like what the recording is, but for it to learn the actual words, it's gonna take more data. In the case of Book Islands Maori, we use approximately 237 minutes, um, hopefully more after this winter, um, which has about 36,000 words from 10 speakers, which range from 30 to 75 years old, from four different islands in the archipelago. WER's word error rate 
CDR, this carrier error rate. And these are three algorithms. So leaf speech would be the equivalent of a deep learning neural network without a multilingual component. Wave to vector would be a transformer with a multilingual component. Calvi would be is the old system. So these old systems try to break up the problem into first I'm gonna figure out what the sound is, and then I'm gonna draw the probability of these sounds becoming a word, and then I'm gonna draw the probability of these words making up an actual sentence of the language. It had it is a system that is more than 20 years old. It is very, it's good with little amounts of data, but it has many limits in how much it can learn from large amounts of data, which is what it's the older system now. We prefer end-to-end -end solutions at this point. As you can see, within the deep learning range, if it lacks the multilingual model, it performs much worse, both in word error rate and character error rate. And we are now to the point in with deep learning where we can improve, improve upon the character error rate of the older uh, RIs. These use statistical methods, and that's why they were relatively good with little data, but they could not scale. Let me, so one thing that people usually don't do in CS conferences is to show actual examples of things working, but as linguists, I know you're interested in looking at actual examples. So these are the three systems and the transcriptions that they produce. I'm gonna play you the sound clips. As you can see, the wave to back transcription is not bad. Like, it gets really close. By the way, you could hear our eternal companion in tropical environments, a rooster in the back. <laughs> Noelis has heard the word ketu. He really did pronounce something like ketu uh, with a little bit of devoicing, and the computer was confused about it. Again, the newer methods would prefer accuracy in sounds than accuracy in words. And it's only after they have a lot of data that they can begin truly understanding the words. Oh my god, you know what? As you can see, there are problems, again, with words, with the word boundaries. But this is a transcription that's decent enough that it would take less time to correct it than to start it over by hand. And, yes. Oh, sorry. So, uh, how long, uh, how many hours of, uh, you know, data would would you need for the word error rate to be, um, you know, ideal? Depen well, obviously, it depends on the definition of ideal. Here we have, admittedly, a low bar, which is will it take less time to correct it than to do it by hand? Right. If you want it to be reliable enough that you can transcribe a video on YouTube with it. Um, probably in the, not 100, but probably between 10 and 50, something like that. Obviously the, so the, it, decre it doesn't decrease in a linear fashion. Um, the more data you get, the smaller gains you make. So it, the gain from 10 to 100, uh, it takes a lot more data to reduce from 6% to 3% error rate, which is right. average. Um, People who have, for example, there's work in Mexico to transcribe uh, Nahuatl and also Zapotec languages, and they have about 80 hours of data, and this has made it so that the systems are competitive with English systems. Like they, have gave, they get work error rates of between 5 and 10%, which is highly desirable. At that point, you could have the system giving you a good preliminary transcription. Um, we are hoping to get to at least 10 hours, so we, for the first time this, um, February and March, we were doing field work in the Cook Islands, and we incorporated a system into the workflow. So the com so students would do recordings with native speakers. The computer would provide the first pass. Our non-expert uh, students of Cook Islands Laudi would correct the computer pass, and then in the third pass, this, the expert would correct it. And we managed to get about an hour of data in a month, which is which would have taken us a year. Uh, in our previous workflow. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, uh, it's no longer a toy, it really is a tool at this mm -hmm. point. Did I ask you a question? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Oh, uh, so I guess I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So way to vec 2 has this kind of cross-linguistic background database that draws on things. Yes. But then in order to know and basically how to spell things and like how the language has long vowels at all, it 
has to know something about the language going in, or it doesn't? Like, also, so if you did it knowing nothing, you right. would call that zero shot right. transcription. Yeah. If you gave it a little bit, which is what we're doing, right. it would be called few shot transcription. So my, I guess based on that, my question is, how big is the sort of gold standard that you needed in the first place? Or the there's so there's so little research on this. There's just no gold standard. Uh, and all, it's interesting because also even though these two terms are very common in computer literature, zero and few shot, right. no one knows what few means. Everyone just uses like the old definition. Right. So few shot can mean ten examples, or it can mean ten thousand examples. Right. Um, probably not ten thousand, but I mean a thousand could still be considered few, for example, if you're dealing with something very large. The, um, there's no gold standard. Obviously, if you do zero shot, it's not going to know anything about the actual orthography. So it's going to give 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 you. It's probably going to imagine that its vowels sound a little bit like Spanish, and its consonants sound a little bit like something else that it might have in the short sure. system, like yeah. Japanese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I you know I've never tried the zero shot transcription. Maybe I should do it these days. Because I mean, it is it is for example common that in in, uh, in romanization of Japanese, you can find that the long vowels are are annotated. So yeah. I wonder if. Yeah. So this is a great point because probably if you learn Japanese. In characters, not in romanization. Yeah. So, it, so it does have. Be, it learns the writing systems as well as the, the transcript. As it learns the transcriptions of the output, it learns the writing systems. Yeah. So it's a good question. And my impression would be that Jap the Japanese inputs were only in characters. Yeah. But there's going to be other languages in there that have a macron called long back. I'll go back to you know that. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and maybe it'll just do two use. We should do that as well. Yeah? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yes. I have a question that is related to Tibetan. Because you tested, like, uh, also why you do transcription. We have, like, this, like, uh, uh, muted sound, right? Yeah. And I but you obtained good results. It was mm -hmm. kind of impressive. Yeah. I was impressed too. I was, yeah. I was but not how do you, confident that it would work. Yeah. How do you, I mean, because it's also learning the words. The words so for, itself, in, yeah. for English, it has to solve the, the challenge of um, night, for example, K-N-I-G-H-T. There's things in there that don't have a sound, but that should be transcribed. So it has, as, it's, as it learns its conversion, it must also learn the orthographic forms that it should be aiming for. Um, it must have succeeded in learning that there were only so many words in the Tibetan yeah. corpus and that it should that be. That was impressive, yeah, with Wiley that, yeah. And exactly, Wiley would be night, like night example run amok. Yes. Yeah, uh, I was also, I was not expecting to work, to be perfectly honest. That, is, that was really interesting. We'll have to see which ones it messed up. Like if it, you later have to tell me if you noticed that there were specific letters being dropped out or something like that. Yeah, because that would be, I would be very interested in knowing um, you can see it. You can see that problem in English with the transcription of foreign names. If you start a YouTube video that has a lot of foreign words, um, yeah, you're gonna see it taking bad tumbles at trying to figure out what it's saying. This is from Grigri, which is again the language from Costa Rica. Much more complex phonology. I have uh, nasal vowels. It has tone and still. Um, so this is an example that had good results. This is an average one, and this is one where it was bad. As you can see, the words don't really match. The average, um, I'm sorry, this is the median character error rate was 23%. The median word error rate was 65. You can see that the poor computer, I mean, it's almost like moving the microphone or something here so that you couldn't hear anything. This one is like a dialectal variation. I'm very happy to see that it got it as it sounded and not necessarily as it spelled. So it is, it, if you give it enough data, it will probably become aware of these kinds of variations. This is a language called Kabikar, which is a sister language of Grigri. We had less data when we watched the Kentucky experiment, 12 speakers. Um, Median 22% character error rate, word error rate 53. This is a good result, median result, not great result. 
ਯੋਗਾ ਕਰਕੇ ਹੋਣਾ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਗਾੜੀ ਦੇ ਗਾ ਹਫਤੇ ਹੋਣਾ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਰਾਹ ਵੀ ਖੂਬੇ ਮੇਰੀ ਗਾ ਰਹਿ ਤੇ ਸੋ ਨਿਰਾ ਇਹ ਤੇ ਸੋ ਹੈ ਗੁਰ ਕਾ ਕਾ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਮਾ ਜੋ ਕਾ ਜੋ ਕਾ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਹੈ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਾਂ ਦੀ ਰਾਜ ਸ਼੍ਰੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਸੋ ਵਨ ਥਿੰਗ ਮਾਈ ਬੀ ਹੈਪਨਿੰਗ ਹੀਅਰ ਵਿਚ ਇਸ ਅ ਫੈਨੋਮਨਲ ਕੋਲ ਆਈ ਮੀਨ ਓਵਰ ਫੇਰੀ ਮਾਈ ਬੀ ਹੈਪਨਿੰਗ ਹੀਅਰ ਬਟ ਇਟ ਮਾਈ ਬੀ ਫੋਕਸਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਮਚ ਔਨ ਦ ਸਪੀਕਰਸ ਦੈਟ ਇਟ ਨੋਸ ਫਰ ਦਿਸ ਥਿੰਗ ਆ ਸੈਡ ਆਮ ਨਾਟ ਸੋ ਕੌਨਫੀਡੈਂਟ ਦੈਟ ਇਟ ਵੁਡ ਬੀ ਏਬਲ ਟੂ ਜਨਰਲਾਈਜ਼ ਇਫੈਕਟਿਵਲੀ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਡੂ ਨੀਡ ਟੂ ਵਾਰਨ ਯੂ ਦੈਟ ਥੀਸ ਰਿਜ਼ਲਟਸ ਆਰ ਆਈ ਸ਼ੋਇੰਗ ਯੂ ਵਰ ਫਰ ਸਪੀਕਰਸ ਆਫ ਦ ਸਿਸਟਮ ਹੈਡ ਹਰਟ ਬੀਫੋਰ ਇਫ ਦ ਸਿਸਟਮ ਹੈਸ ਨਾਟ ਹਰਟ ਸਮਵਨ ਬੀਫੋਰ ਦ ਐਰਰ ਰੇਟਸ ਵਿਲ ਡਬਲ ਪ੍ਰੋਕਸੀਮਲੀ ਸੋ um this an experiment we conducted where we extracted people from the training data set and then we figured out we tried to figure out what the errors would be so the average error if the computer doesn't know you would be 15% error rate and 46 uh, sorry character error, error rate and 46 word error rate for cook and smile these are again if the computer doesn't know you so my ego you can see it starts missing vowels uh, more problems with the word boundaries so problems here with missing vowels and stuff like that so as i told you we do have working prototypes for the asr transcription system we are working on improving the we want to frankly need to transcribe it more in order for them to really get a heartbeat and to be so that we can confidently use them to do good, I mean good first pass transcriptions but if we are already seeing dramatic improvements in our transcription times for the vocabulary model let's see how it goes if any point have you have questions but by no means um i'm going to show you a little bit of work on machine translation so the same system the transformers that you can use to transform what should you want to answer you can use to turn english into french for example so again these are called transformers we have about 90000 words of read read and we have the uh, spanish translation for many of them we managed to get 10000 pairs by text pairs of read read in spanish from mostly our learning textbooks we do have the issue which you're probably very familiar with of a lot of variation in the input so different scholars show some representations like this is the nasal vowel as the spanish writes it as how we that writes it and as writes it and as marjorie writes it um be, for example the line under the vowel can be encoded in many different ways in unicode that we have found all of them so we need to standardize that in the input the language of saying human language has uh, ph- phonetic phenomena that make it dif- uh, the actual pronunciation is different sometimes there's nasal stimulation so for example this i is nasal by virtue of being next to the m that's actually the other way around the m is nasal by virtue of being next to the i but because these two are nasal you can choose to write it or not uh unstressed vowels can be deleted so the word mom can be a me or me there is also this variation so the different dialects have for example nyara and nyo or road and most relevant to you all is that of course materials are usually published you know as you hear them so here are transcriptions um from native speakers which of course we love and we need but they might be written in uh, a form that might be very different from what the system is used the word time means a lot and we found it in 16 different forms so and they're unpredictable you never know exactly how they're going to express the nasality for example is going to be an n is it going to be a line is it going to be nothing so there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to make these data sets um more uniform we've chosen an, some internal representation support but we have to convert into the representations going in out of the representations going out so they can be read by humans these are some examples of the results that we've gotten so if you want numbers we the, they range between blue 14 and 16 um if you have spanish like if you have english and german pairs in a system with large train data you get blue 40 so it's about less than half of the performance but you can see that it's starting to understand a little bit like 
for example, the bird is sitting on the branch, you do get, this is what it should get, and this is what the system offered as a prediction. Sometimes it hallucinates things, as many artificial intelligence systems do. So it should have said that it was sitting next to the river, it said that it was sitting next to the road, probably because it was close, the closest it could get. Um, this one should say that the shirt is hanging, that my shirt is hanging over there. The, the translation just says, their <laughs> shirt is. Um, this one has um, a description of where, that you were at the house, but that you were standing at the house. The computer could not see the position of it, only figure out that you were standing at the house. It still has to work, but you can see that with materials that linguists already have, like textbooks and grammars, you could get one of these systems going. Uh, we have not worked on this in Kubernetes, but we are testing two things for review. We're testing unsupervised uh, systems where you can where you try to use the monolingual text to use it to learn its own internal structure, and then with that improve the performance. And we're testing um, something called transfer learning. With the Kabeka data, we're trying to see if the computer can learn both languages at the same time and therefore improve its results. Um, before I continue, questions or comments? Fun up. Um, parsing, as you all know, is the process of deciphering the structure um, of uh, a given string. So figuring out that some things are verbs, pronouns, some things are subjects and auxiliaries of one another. That's the sentence that we read, Isashkina, which is, how are you, how did you sleep? <coughs> we did it, we did it kind of like what you were doing it, but not started with CCG, but, um, CCG, and but starting with just uh, standard C of Jesus and singular trees. So we built one of these was a sentence that we made about an NP and a VP, and we transformed it into a dependency structure later. We've done that with about um, 1,500 words. So this is the longest one that we have managed to, uh, to make a manual parse for as we train the system. So it's about how you cut cocoa juice. As you can see, this one is from the oral corpus. So it's not just some example of a technical and Ruby is really spoken, which is what we want in the data set. With using this, we've trained the system to learn parsings automatically. Just to tell you a little bit about how this is done, the evaluations are based on these two metrics, which is unlabeled attachment and label attachment. So unlabeled attachment means, is the arrow going in the right direction? I don't care about the label, but is the arrow okay? Labeled attachment is, are both the arrow and the label okay? Like, did I find my subject and did I correctly identify that it was a subject? This one, um, she's eating rice, has the subject correctly, so this is a verb, a subject, a complement to the main verb, and the direct object, rice, so it has a hundred and all. By the way, you post this just with part of speech, is it a verb or a noun? I'd be happy to share this with you, by the way. This is just an example of what I would look at when it's wrong. This one is yellow hair. So, uh, sorry, hair yellow, yellow hair. This is hair and this is yellow, so it should correctly be a noun and an adjective, and it should be pointing in this direction. You can see that it messed it up. It thinks it's a verb, thinks it's a uh, it's subject, so none of the arrows were in the right direction. It gets a zero in that. Because it didn't get any of the arrow, arrows right, it did not get the arrows and the labels, zero. It did get the punctuation, and the noun's correct, so the parts of speech are 66%. For the Ruby data, we managed to get about these results, so 85% of the arrows go in the right direction. When you give it new data, 81% of the labeled arrows are in the right direction and with the right label. About 90% of the parts of speech are going well, so even this would be very useful to start annotating a corpus and trying to find syntactic patterns. We have begun work on Cook Island's Maori parsing. The tagger is about 92% correct for the parts of speech. The, I tested this last week. Uh, we got about the same thing, like 81 for the labeled attachment and maybe three for the unlabeled attachment. And we are looking for, uh, we do have a group of students who have studied a little bit of Cook Island's Maori working on expanding this data set. 
this is like one of the fancier ones that we have uh, parsed about how public servants are permitted, permitted to travel overseas. Uh, we hope to release these soon. We're working very hard, for example, on making something called the feature system, where determining whether <coughs> the pronouns are exclusive, inclusive, first person, second person, so and finishing the annotations correctly, and for both of the languages. Just very quickly, again, these are very nerdy and very useful for us linguists, but most of the community is not going to care about these arrows. They're not going to care, really, about how it's written. All they want is to tell each other where they're going to get a burger. All they want is to tell each other that they should go out and hang out and have fun. All of these texts that we compile could be turned into very useful tools, like um, predictive keyboard systems. So we've made them for Kabekar, for Dukalans Maori, and we have had success in getting people installing them uh, in both environments. And they're starting to give us feedback, of course, about what's wrong, how things which things don't work, which ones things did work. They have very strange patterns, which uh, CF people usually ignore. For example, we are trying to do parts of the Bible because it was a lot of the text that was available. So it cannot, uh, for a while, it couldn't say, hey, but it could say the names of ancient prophets because that's what the system knew. So these are the kinds of things that you don't think of when you say a big TXT file is input. But we're slowly deploying them and they are, um, and we actually have them in testing right now with young, with not only the teachers, but in the Cook Islands with some younger high schoolers. Fingers crossed they'll give us more feedback. So again, what are we doing this for? I don't like this term, but this chart is very useful. So we'll share it out 2020. I do not flash by I disagree with that. Um, this is the number of labeled data in number of data sets that exist for language. So if there's one data set, uh, two data sets, three data sets, 10 data sets, 100, 1,000, and so forth. And this is the number of labeled data data sets. No data, uh, one data set, <coughs> nothing, 10, 100, and so forth. I don't like the name again, but most languages in the world would be in this category zero, where there's maybe zero or one data set that exists for them. Obviously, the languages that have the most information we want to have a lot of resources, and for which many of these resources are correctly labeled. Most of the languages in the world, as you can see, are labeled with that unfortunate label of Lapwise. We reject that and hope to um, keep working on them. Oops, sorry. Before I go to that, um, people have spoken of the term digital debt, for example. If we don't have the languages on the internet, um, that might mean that they're digitally dead. This is relevant, of course, but we have to remember that what makes people, that what makes languages alive is people who speak them. It's not having computers who remember them. Just think of, I mean, let me ask you guys a question. Like, how many CD-ROMs do you have in your offices right now with what you're recording for stuff? CD-ROMs. <laughs> Cassettes. Wax cylinders. Oh, oh, wow, only, in, only in modern files. Well, we do have cassettes. We do have CD ROMs uh, for rereading, for example. Um, it's just there. Like, it's just, you know, moldy. <laughs> and so, in 20 years, these wave detector models will be also digitally moldy. And having training all these things is going to be useless for the language if it's just there stored in some USB drive. We need, when we create these tools, we need to be thinking of what can we do to have these make an impact in the community. The fact that a computer remembers all these words is not going to make a language more widely spoken. The ideal process would be to use it to help, for example, create communities where people can use the languages. These are, this is a beautiful project called Use Your Voice is still going on, where people who speak Zapotec, both from Mexico and from an People in the U.S. who speak language as well have created communities to share content in Zapotec through, through Twitter and social media. Uh, this is from an activist in Mexico who translated the interface of this phone into Zapotec, and it's because of a person who said that I have the right to have my language in every part of my life, including the interface of my phone, the thing I use the most every day. So whatever we can do to further this process, even if it seems simple by algorithmic standards, is a direction that we should take. 
Imagine if we could train high schoolers to talk to robots and tell them, go left, go right. Something that you could do with the parsers and the ASR working in tandem. We face many challenges. Um, I'm just gonna summarize and we'll discuss it later. For example, data sovereignty. We're very used to the model where like the linguist owns the data and then the community has little say in how it's working. In Cocalans Mani, we've made sure that the ultimate control of the data remains with the Cocalans linguist, with Akbar Nicholas, and with the community so that they can make the decisions of how to proceed. We're very fortunate ethically in that we are working on these because the community wants us to make these tools in order to finish the documentation and stuff. In Riri, we still have the challenge of, we work with the, the more traditional model of linguists and collaborators from communities, but we need uh, to focus on training people from the community in CS, in linguistics, so that they can be the ones commanding these products next. And so that they can take decisions about what to do with all the data. In Maori, there's this whole thing that has been happening. So there's a group of Maori activists who collected a beautiful data set of ASR for the language in New Zealand, Te Reo Māori, and so every tech company in the world was trying to get their hands on it. And of course they were very jealous of it because it took them a lot of effort to compile, but most importantly, it's the communities. And if they're not going to see a cent of this or any gain, like any tools coming out of this, why should they, why should the large computer, like computer program companies benefit from it? So, this discussion is something that we need to have with this. For example, the parsing trees we're going to have for Kogan's body, we're going to have to release them in some way where the community continues to have to, has to give permission to people for them to use it in their projects so that it's not just shared in like a huge model that is trained and packaged away and the community doesn't see all that sent from it. This is one of the main challenges that we have. It's something that we need to be discovering in these projects. That's a little bit of what to do. And so, um, for the people at the workshop, we're gonna be training some of these ASR systems with the data that we have. Um, I'd be happy to share more about the other projects. It's a lot of work and I'd be happy to hear your ideas about it and your feedback. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for people watching. Thanks so much. Yay! Uh, so I do have uh, I do have a question which is very much related to uh, your last slide. Uh, so one thing which I anticipate uh, will happen if we, you know, when we uh, share the wonderful results of these tools with the community is I'm, I'm, I'm certain people will want uh, people within the uh, uh, low resource language communities will want to know how can we use this uh, and um, you know, su suppose there are people without uh, computer science or uh, uh, linguistics training um, what, what are the first things that we can say to maybe encourage uh, people in those communities uh, to, um, to to take the steps to be able to uh, take uh, you know ownership of these uh, tools themselves? The first thing you can do is ask who's the nerd kid here who likes computers and start teaching them how to do it. So I mean the very first thing we should do, we, um, in the Islands, we're going to have a workshop sometime later in the year uh, like to do like an NLP class for people who are programmers in the Cook Islands so that they can start training on this as well and eventually be the ones in charge of the projects. Um, because there are a few people, obviously, with IT knowledge and who could learn NLP. In, in Riri, we need, um, we had a little workshop in November to show them the tools. There were people who expressed interest. We're trying to see how to, to start training in, in CS, for example. And obviously, because it's gonna be, it's gonna be easier to reel them in by telling them, we can teach you how to program as well as we can teach you linguistics. <laughs> we can probably learn that later. Um, it is a challenge, obviously, as all of you know, both of the recording in here, to, if you have 100 people who start the workshop, maybe there's gonna be one person who ends it, but it is it is the very first step. We, there's always gonna be a nerd kid who's gonna to want to learn more. There's always gonna be like some kid with a phone who will want uh, to continue. So devoting resources, money, <laughs> to carrying out these workshops, um, figuring out which members of the community would be interested in continuing the project is always gonna be worthwhile. Um, number one, number two, I guess trying to make tools that make sense, the parsing, for example. 
that was that was too dirty. Now, and it's very interesting for us linguists, but we still have to have to find a concrete application for it that's interesting to me. That's why we're thinking about the robots, because it would be very obvious to tell us well, like a computer to play music in language and that it responds to that. Um, yes, so making there's speak there's always people that are gonna be interested, but we need to figure out how to present this in a way that's not just about you know which algorithm is most efficient and so forth. So what could be useful to this overarching goal that we should have, which is how to keep the languages alive and how to get the community um, involved in the process. I don't know if it answers your question. Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. More questions? Well, I'm just curious about uh, kind of through your EV driven project. Yeah. And um, did you have to uh, introduce many new labels for the languages that you are Sorry, could you say again? Uh, new labels, like the famous label. Yes. Just, I mean, how many new labels compared to the one that are already there? So, <coughs> we have not we have not come up with new labels, but we will have to. Yes. I'll just piggyback on that question and ask also, how much a priori knowledge of the language of syntax do you need in order to make the three lines? That's a fine <laughs> question. Um, we haven't invented new labels yet. We haven't proposed okay. new labels yet. We will. We will have to propose a new feature at some okay. point because it has a chance that some languages in Europe have, but this one really like so. Riri has something called the Hodierno tense, uh, which old French has, for example, which is for things that happen today. So something from this morning and from right now would have the same tense. Um, we're thinking of proposing that feature. But other than that, we've kind of just fit the language into the interesting labels because we want, yeah, we obviously, I mean, got the instruction that you need to keep it as even as possible. We're making rich use of like the X parts of speech uh, column, but, and we will have to do the X, like X relationships in the like last column, the annotations, because definitely uh, in the Cook Islands body, for example, the auxiliaries can be tense aspect moves, they can be directionals, they can be, there's a bunch of other things in Polynesian verbal clusters, and we want to distinguish them, but in the universal system, they're just aux. So we will make rich use of the, like a, a column. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we had the same problem also with Tibet. We find, of course, aux, what is an aux, because I mean, we had previous, like, manual annotator, this was yeah. a project, and they annotated with aux. What they thought was ox, but then what is really an ox, like it's better. Yeah. So basically, what we decide to do now is just create like a special verb list. Yeah. So we have like a tag, like I don't know, be invariant, and then like I don't know, well, that's the verb. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, your question, do you mean how much a human needs to know in order to start this project? Well, sort of, yeah, because with a lot of these little resource languages, they might have sort of use of prior syntax or maybe something that. That uh, people don't. So something that doesn't really fit the mold. I mean, like it, it, it didn't happen in this particular case. But take like whole period, for example, which kind of rewrote the books on how you know heads actually work in a lot of syntax. Mm -hmm. You know what happens if you have a language like that and you want to make tree banks, but it turns out that actually you know it, it, it's not easy. That is a fine question. So I'm gonna try to answer it in like a very concrete way, and then we'll see if I manage to answer. For the for the Google Analytics Model project. For example, uh, we tr uh, we have so this is someone's thesis uh, starting the the tree bank. She had knowledge of Hawaiian. This is Sarah Carr. She had knowledge of Hawaiian, and she studied this the grammar that Dr. Van Nicholas wrote. So she had a little bit of knowledge about how Polynesian languages work. Sure. Um, the people who are helping us continue it. Um, same uh, Simon Valentine, for example, has studied both the real language and Cook Islands Maori, at least for like the equivalent of a semester of a quarter. So they have some knowledge of the grammar. They're not expert speakers, but they have had to study the grammar. Uh, with Rebu, we have a problem that probably the learning curve is a bit steeper. And also, a weird problem is that the grammar for this is in English. The grammar for Rebu is in Spanish. And so we're having to translate it in order for students to learn it. Um, and we have had less success with hiring outside people to help us with the tech. As for hiring members of the community, we have not had uh, success because, as in the case of the Kalanswali, the only people who know this are 
Dr. Nicholas, my colleague, and the teachers that we train to teach high school. They only, I mean, their training is in identifying a verb and a noun and so forth, so we would have to train them a lot in order to get uh, the required knowledge. As for Ruby, yeah, we still need to work with people. So, because it's been, it would be ideal to recruit community members, and just from a very pragmatic point, too, because we want the money going to them, um, but we've had, had very a uh, lot of difficulties uh, hiring them. So the students that we hired have had a little bit of knowledge. If someone comes in with zero, they're obviously not going to be ideal for this project. Mm -hmm. Did that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think that answers, I think that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And obviously, so there's many cases where the students that cannot figure it out, I know a little bit, but I cannot figure it out, so we have to go to the person who wrote the grammar, and it's like, like, what are we supposed to do here? And there's a couple of structures in Polynesian languages we're still trying to figure out exactly how to fit them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll go. Um, maybe one more question. This is just sort of a technical thing, but I'm always interested in how ASR systems, systems, ASR systems um, deal with tonal languages. Oh. Um, so, yeah, how did you teach uh, your, like, how did you teach? Um, to that to to recognize tone in Ruby. Older systems, because they separated these things, because you so in, in older systems you have to give it the explicit phonemic inventory for it to really know what's happening. Right. And so you you did have a problem of like, oh, is the high tone A different from a low tone A from a computer's perspective? Do I have to separate these diacritic like the diacritic, like write it like A, big H, for it to know that it's a phone and tone. In modern systems, they are black boxes. So yeah. it's because it's end to end with a big black box in the middle, we, it learns it, we assume it learns it, and there's very little research on exactly, uh, on if the representation of balance with high tones are similar. Nine, so that's something I need to do next. Like, for example, are the, like the internal embeddings for words with high tones similar to each other, and dissimilar to words with low tones. So if I had a minimal pair that was distinguished only by tone, well, I mean, would there be some part of the embedding that clearly refers to tone and is that stable throughout the system? I have not seen much or any research, because if from the CSI, the just trust, like, oh, it worked, there we go. Um, and linguists haven't really gotten much into it. So there is there is more research for how this work in the older systems than in the newer systems. And the older systems, it had a lot of trouble. Uh, you have to separate the diacritics. The better results you got was with explicitly telling it there's a character that's the A, there's a character that's the high, trying to find, figure out a pattern, and then like relink them and uh, correcting the output. Is that does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. that's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe uh, could you say a few words about the future of this uh, technology? <coughs> And um, perhaps in light of uh, latest uh, developments in AI, uh, perhaps. ChatGPT doesn't know Riri. Oh my God. So <laughs> do you, do you, you're not going to see it. I asked it to tell me, to give me a conversation with Riri. It's a moralist with Chomsky Colton, and he's right. It, it only does, not only does it not know it, it confidently makes it up. Like it, it, I was like, sure, I'll give you a conversation. And he gave me a bunch of gibberish, and then it invented a cultural festival. It was like, <laughs> and here, it's like, I'm going to the cultural of whatever, where we can eat food. No, it has, like, not only it, it, it impersonated like a brewery person, in both culture and language, you know, oblivious to the fact that it was making up gibberish. It was so bad. <laughs> uh, there is enough Cook Island Smoggy on the internet that it managed to learn, like, Arzen Cook Island Smiley is really bad, but at least it's similar to the language as opposed to Riri, which is just a catastrophe. Um, that is a fine question. I am more of the school of like Timmy Gebru uh, on this, where we should train specific systems to do specific things uh, to minimize the risk of them being used for harm. The, um, it is an active debate in AI and indigenous community circles of what of how is it okay for these models to speak Te Reo Maori, the language of New Zealand, because they do know a lot mm -hmm. for that, because there's so much on the internet. 
So um, is it okay to have this new intelligence that's interacting with us? Is it okay for this computer to impersonate a Maori person, which also brings with them all the culture and all the genealogy and stuff like this? So this is someone who claims to speak Maori, the ChatGPT, but has no genealogy or clear connections to the land, has introduced themselves to the people and so forth. Um, it's an interesting question. I'll have to read more about what Native App has to say about it to <laughs> truly figure it out. I can tell you that we're, I mean, it's people who hype it up and who say that it's uh, intelligent and uh, inflection point evidently have not tried to use this with anything other than English. Hmm. Probably, I mean, the Spanish is okay. Uh, I've, I've read of people who have tried it in Catalan, and they say the Catalan works fairly well. Um, but you can see that it's still like, um, I mean, this is very much alive and well. Probably newer, large, very large language model systems perform well in this area. Probably. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll have to try it with the languages that you work with. Have you tried it with Pablo Ubuntu? Uh, uh, no, I haven't yet. You um, should. I should. Let's see what, what it says. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is the uh, human language is not a solved problem yet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know if, this, if that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you so much. Yeah, perhaps we'll wrap it up there. Okay, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much for your, to the audience online. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being here.